Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting us by sponsoring this video. Inflatable architecture has a fascinating journey, from usage with the US military, NASA development and space colonization, to play structures. That evolution also includes visionary architectural images of the future, and it branches into art and counterculture movements dedicated to putting the creation of buildings into the hands of the people. Since their invention, inflatables have sparked the imaginations of fanciful dreamers and practical problem solvers in equal measure. You are probably familiar with other examples of technology developed for NASA that ultimately found their way into everyday applications. You might think of things like memory foam or Tang, the powdered orange drink, which turns out was not invented by NASA. But anyway, the common formula goes that space or military program researches way to solve a particular problem that they have, like isolating vibration on takeoff, and then develop a material or a technology to solve that problem. But of course, after we have this new technology, there could be so many other potential uses. It could take decades to discover everything that one of these inventions can do, like my memory foam mattress here at home. These everyday, downstream uses for this high-tech stuff are usually not quite as glamorous as going into space, but the trade-off is that they're usually a little bit more relevant to our everyday lives. Inflatable structures are that way too, which have become a go-to technique in the toolkit for architects. But this migration from NASA into architecture has continued pretty steadily for the past 60 to 70 years and will likely continue for years to come. To see one of the more interesting inflatable architectures around here in Chicago, I have to get off this bed and head down south to the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology. This building behind me doesn't necessarily look like it's inflatable, but it is. It's called the Kaplan Institute at IIT. It was designed in 2018 by the architect John Ronan. And while it doesn't look like most inflatables that you've probably seen, its facade is made up of inflated pillows of a plastic material called ETFE or ethylene tetrafluoroethylene. This material was developed for NASA in 1970 by the DuPont Company. The inflated ETFE facade offers a very lightweight solution to the problem of capping off a building onto the exterior while insulating it for heat and cold, while at the same time it allows natural daylight to pass through. Although it isn't inflatable like any other standard blow-up mattress or a beach toy, the amount of air inside of those pillows is tightly controlled with a super sophisticated pneumatic system. The system adapts to shifting weather and daylight in real time to balance energy use and daylight potential. This project represents some of the more advanced but also maybe more covert uses of inflatables today. But before getting to the level of understanding that makes this kind of application possible, the exploration of inflatables has gone through a number of twists and turns, from military equipment to going to space, to even embodying the promise of saving the world for both technocrats and hippies alike. The journey here was a funny set of contingent opportunists fumbling through how to take advantage of a technology that was developed for one thing, but good for many more. And there was a lot of fun experiments along the way. But before the fun starts, the first inflatable structure was constructed to solve a very serious problem. During the 1940s, Japan had just bombed Pearl Harbor, and the United States was committed to detecting incoming threats before they manifest. The U.S. Air Force commissioned the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory to develop a way to keep radar equipment operational in the harsh conditions of the Arctic. This was an important strategic location for detecting potential invasions or missile strikes. However, the radar signal could easily be disrupted by ice or snow accumulations that might occur on the dish. Also, the precise speed of the radar spin was susceptible to wind gusts. Any sudden change in the rotational velocity would nullify the detection of signals being detected from distant sources. So the Air Force needed a structure to be able to shield the radar. But in order for the equipment to continue sending and receiving its electromagnetic waves, the structure had to allow these waves to pass right through it as if it didn't even exist. No current building technology at the time could provide these contradictory qualities. A man named Walter Byrd was put in charge of the problem. His task was made even more difficult due to the logistical requirements of constructing these enclosures in such distant and harsh conditions. They had to be lightweight so they could be easily brought to the site. They also had to be deployed and set up quite quickly with very few people that could not be especially trained in the construction of buildings. So given all of these pressures, Bird didn't look to traditional architectural solutions to provide his inspiration. Rather, he looked to other transportation technology, specifically hot air balloons and zeppelins, and he imagined being on the inside of them. 
but 1946, the Ray Dome was born, and here's Walter Byrd demonstrating the structural capacity of the prototype. The Ray Dome, a name made from the combination of radar and dome, was a soft, inflatable, balloon-like structure supported by pressurized air. These structures were completely spherical in shape, and they relied on a neoprene-coated fiberglass fabric to provide the air tightness and the tensile strength for withstanding the pressure that was needed to hold all this stuff up. Shortly after this proof of concept, NASA picked up the technology and developed a better fabric material. It's still the most commonly used for this application today, and you may have heard of it. It's technically called PTFE, or polytetrafluoroethylene, or more commonly known as Teflon. A PTFE membrane is made by coating the PTFE resin, which has a very high chemical stability, and applying it to the surface of a glass fiber fabric substrate. NASA used this material in spacesuits, but also inflatable structures like Echo 1. The technology was also instrumental in NASA's dream for space colonies like the Aerospace Toroidal Space Station. Inflatable structures can provide a lot of volume, up to three times as much as any alternative or traditional structures and crafts. And it does this with very low weight. Once our Radome inventor learned of this new PTFE material in 1956, he left his post at the Air Force and founded Bird Air, a company dedicated to finding commercial uses for inflatable and fabric building structures here on Earth. Package originally five feet long and three feet wide, light and compact. Air from blowers bulges the building upward and outward. Tension keeps the walls and roof taut, as you'll see in this demonstration at Los Angeles. Soon we'll have a pneumatically supported building 80 feet long, 40 feet wide, and 20 feet high. The blowers maintain a constant stream of low pressure air which enables the building to retain its shape even when the door is open to permit entry of a vehicle. Temporary warehousing gets an assist from the air house. I think when most people think of architecture, they think of heavy, permanent, and static structures made of stone, concrete, steel, or glass. Even the first architectural theorist that we've ever discovered, Vitruvius, who had only three requirements for good architecture, he included durability in its top three. But the natural world is usually made of soft and wiggly things that are capable of adaptation and change. Bird and countless engineers and architects ever since the invention of inflatable architecture have been dreaming and searching for ways that more of our structures could be reconsidered using this technology. One of Bird's experiments was in his own backyard, where he designed an enclosure for his outdoor swimming pool during the winter. The construction was featured on the cover of Life magazine in 1957, and then two years later, the technology was declared the most exciting idea in building construction techniques in decades. Inflatables offer the promise of worlds within worlds, colonies of new environments that can stand against the outside world using only air and a thin membrane. It's the ultimate lack of distance between an inside and an outside, putting you even closer to that tenuous threshold than glass would. All this adds up to make inflatables the stuff that dreams are made of, sometimes quite literally. During the 1960s, you have technocratic dreamers like Buckminster Fuller or Fry Otto, imagining how this technology could work at vast scales across various territories. These kinds of visionary projections are born from an attitude of taming nature through technology, like creating cities for 40,000 people on the Arctic. But you also have more ground-up humanitarian efforts by practices like Ant Farm, to empower people to take charge of their own spaces through inflatable construction. In counterculture circles, blow-up structures were used to critique the status quo of how we live and work. They offered quick and cheap ways of experimenting with space to craft new social and psychological environments through the built environment. Ant Farm created the Inflato Cookbook, a comprehensive how-to DIY manual for fast, cheap inflatables. That became an important guide for passing knowledge from institutions like NASA to anyone that was interested. They put the power to create buildings in the hands of everyone. More commercial efforts to see what inflatables can do still include empowering people to play or imagine themselves in other worlds. In 1959, John Skurlock, a former NASA employee, started his own company to enclose playing fields and surfaces. As he was blowing up one of his structures to enclose a tennis court, a few of his employees decided to hop on top. While watching the adults enjoy bouncing around on the forgiving ground surface, 
He had the idea for a children's space-themed anti-gravity play environment. He founded Spacewalk Inc. that sells inflatable bounce houses, slides, and obstacle courses to this day. You can thank him for bringing his NASA know-how to provide entertainment to children in backyard and block parties everywhere. Even today, the experiments to figure out what inflatables can do isn't over. You have artists like the Barcelona-based Panique Productions filling courtyards with balloons to create otherworldly environments that defamiliarize the familiar architecture around them, or artists like Anish Kapoor creating alien blobs that fill the Grand Palais in Paris. We still have visionary architects like Diller and Scafidio and Renfro imagining environments like the bubble at the Hirshhorn that acts as a squishy counterpoint to the Brutalist building designed by Gordon Bunshaft. And we also still have the counterculture DIYers like Space Buster, who uses a delivery van to bring a balloon that can house up to 80 people. You enter the passenger door of the van into a translucent bubble where people engage in critical dialogue. The membrane acts as a semi-permeable border between the public and the more private space of the collective conversations on the role of space in the city. As I've alluded to in some recent posts, I've been working hard on some big things for this channel. I started making videos in this tiny den about a year ago, and I can't believe how amazing that you, the viewers, have been on this journey. I wear a lot of hats throughout the week. I'm a professor and an administrator, but making these videos has really been my passion project, and I'm always striving to learn more and create some better content for everybody. One of the things that I've been working on is a collaboration with other creators on a streaming service called Nebula. On Nebula, there is an extended version of this video with some unscripted thoughts and opinions about the subject of the video that aren't necessarily so YouTube friendly. So this part of the video that you're watching now on Nebula is replaced with that director's cut version. I mean, one of the things that I think of is that maybe sometimes they're a gimmick. Nebula has a ton of exclusive content and it only includes the top educational creators in the game. And based on my channel's YouTube analytics, I know that you already watch most of them, like not just for bikes and half as interesting. Nebula is a platform made by creators to offer the best possible viewing experience that is convenient and seamless, it's adless, and wherever you click, you're always offered amazing high quality informational videos. But what does Nebula have to do with CuriosityStream, the sponsor of this video? Well, CuriosityStream loves educational creators, and they love supporting educational content. So we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link down in the description below, not only do you get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. It's not a trial, you'll have it as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. CuriosityStream is really the go-to place for all forms of documentaries. I personally cannot get enough documentaries about space, but if you're just more into architecture, you could watch Visual Acoustics, a documentary that I mentioned in my video about photography. Visual Acoustics is the life story of Julius Shulman, the famous architectural photographer of modernism. So click the link below, curiositystream.com slash Stuart Hicks, to get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. It's a great way to support the channel and just educational content as a whole. It's pretty rare for NASA technology to really make its way into changing how we make buildings. Inflatable buildings have a fascinating history and promising potential for the future. From Arctic colonization, to space colonization, to safety equipment, play structures, and even components of permanent buildings, inflatables are still finding their way into structuring the environments that we inhabit. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and a subscribe to the channel if you're into it. We'll continue putting out videos on the built environment on Thursdays, and in the meantime, check out some of these other videos if you haven't already. See you over there.